الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله وسلم وبارك على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين وسلم تسليما كثيرا أما بعد All praise is due to Allah We praise him abundantly the way he deserves to be praised And we ask Allah to exalt the mention and grant peace and send his blessings and salutations upon the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. What a, what a blessed occasion and a, what a wonderful time to be with you and the last 10 nights of Ramadan. Surely, surely the acquisition of knowledge is among the most noble acts of worship. And... Let us at least agree that our intention, since you might not be reading your Quran right now, excuse me, or engaging in some other act of worship, let us at least have the intention that we want to learn Islam in order to get closer to Allah and in order to practice Islam properly. And if it just so happens that it is Laylatul Qadr, then whatever reward that is associated with this acquisition of knowledge will be equivalent or beyond the what it will take you 83 years and four months of learning this deen. So if you spend 83 years and four months learning this deen, tonight the reward according to the hadith will be more than that. So that's a big deal. And tonight's discussion, even though see, it, it appears to be basic from a face value point of view or when you approach it you'll be surprised that the intricacies within the topic are ones that many of us are not aware of and of course the objective of learning is putting to practice and implementation so let us uh, go on this journey together and learn what does islam have to say about the etiquettes of giving salam, greetings in general, the etiquettes of speaking, and the etiquettes of joking. And some of which will be very, very hot. The discussion on those will be very hot because of the contemporary issues that we face on daily basis in the Muslim world. First and foremost, let us speak about Adabu Salam. Uh, the salam or the greeting of peace is one of the most noble acts and a very particular unique quality of Islam and Muslims and even though it might have been practiced it was practiced by prophets in the past as we have many mentions in the Quran and the communication between Ibrahim and the Malaika salam and the salam was mentioned uh, some of the Jews, uh, they also use similar expressions. But the only nation that has really upheld this act of worship and maintained it and is known as a, as a trademark for that nation is Muslims. The Salam is an integral part of our relationship with Allah and our relationship with fellow Muslims. Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu said anna rajulan sa'ala al-nabiyya sallallahu alayhi wa sallam ayyul islami khayr a man asked the prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which aspect of islam is the best or you can also understand it as how can i have the best type of islam what is the highest quality of of islam that i can adhere to qala tut'im al-ta'am وَتَقْرَأُ السَّلَامَ عَلَى مَنْ عَرَفْتَ وَمَنْ لَمْ تعرف. The Prophet Sallallahu said, You feed food, you provide food, let me say, you provide food, and you read the salam upon the people, upon those whom you know, and those whom you do not, do not know. And the hadith is in Bukhari. So one of the qualities of Islam is that, and that is the first point of, of contention that I want to highlight, is that it is very common to many Muslims that they only actually give salam to the people that they know. As for the people that they do not know, they ignore them. 
And that goes against the concept of perfection in one's Islam, wherein the Prophet wasallam said that you, if you really want to practice Islam in the ultimate sense, then you should read the salam to the people that you know and the people that you do not know. Among the etiquettes of salam is that you raise your voice in the salam in a moderate fashion. You don't scream to the point that you freak people out. And you don't lower your voice to the point that the people say, I'm sorry, what did you say? And so you have to repeat yourself multiple times. Thirdly, the scholars and the fuqaha, they say, based on the understanding of all the narrations, that initiating salam is a recommended act of worship, sunnah mustahabba, it's a recommended act of worship. And replying to this recommended act of worship is obligatory. Whether you reply with the equivalent or with what is superior. So when you initiate the salam, that's a recommended act of worship. Which means if you don't begin the salam, you're not sinful, but you are definitely missing out on tremendous reward. You are missing out on tremendous reward. We will see some of the narrations pertaining to that, inshaAllah. As for replying with an equivalent or superior, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah An-Nisa, Ayah 68, وَإِذَا حُيِّيتُمْ بِتَحِيَّةٍ فَحَيُّوا بِأَحْسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَى كُلِّ شَيْءٍ حَسِيبًا And if you are greeted with a greeting, then greet back with what is better than that. Or رُدُّوهَا Or with the equal, or with the same. Verily, Allah is over everything accountable. Fully, uh, uh, has full account over everything. Allah Azza wa Jal takes everything into full account. So initiating the salam is recommended, returning the salam is obligatory. Why? The Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, حَقُّ الْمُسْلِمِ عَلَى الْمُسْلِمِ خَمْسِ The right of a Muslim upon a fellow Muslim are five things. The first of which is رَدُّ salam, Returning the salam. And this is an indication that it's obligatory because it's a haqq, it's a, it's a right that is due to the fellow Muslim. وَعِيَادَةُ الْمَرِيدِ And visiting the sick person. وَاتِّبَاعُ الْجَنَائِزِ And walking in the funeral processions. وَإِجَابَةُ الدَّعْوَةِ And responding to an invitation. وَتَشْمِيتُ الْعَاطِسِ And saying basically, أَرْحَمُكَ اللَّهِ To the one who sneezes. Now, what are the variations or the variants in giving salam? We have the famous hadith of Imran ibn Hussain. قَالْ جَاءَ رَجُلٌ إِنَ النَّبِيِّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ فَقَالَ السَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ فَرَدَّ عَلَيْهِ السَّلَامُ ثُمَّ جَلَسْ فَقَالَ النَّبِيُّ صَلَّى اللَّهُ عَلَيْهُ وَسَلَّمْ عَشْرُ A man came in and he came to Prophet Sallallahu and he gave him, he said, Assalamu Alaikum. Prophet Sallallahu returned his salam. Then the man sat down, then the Prophet said, Ten. Ten. ثُمَّ جَاءَ آخَرُ فَقَالَ أَسَّلَامُ عَلَيْكُمْ وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ Another man came and he said, Assalamu Alaikum وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ He added, وَرَحْمَةُ اللَّهِ The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam replied to him. Then he sat down and he said, عشرون, twenty. ثم جاء آخر. Then a third one came. فقال السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبرك وبركاته. فرد عليه فجلس فقال ثلاثون. Then the man sat down. The Prophet ﷺ returned the salam. The man sat down. The Prophet ﷺ said ثلاثون thirty. And the scholars obviously explain that the, when you say السلام عليكم you get ten good deeds. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله is twenty good deeds. السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته is thirty good deeds. Uh, 30 good deeds, we know already from the other ayat and hadith that al hasana to bi ashri amthaliha, each deed is multiplied by 10. So basically it's 100, 200, 300. Wallahu yudha'ifu liman yasha. And Allah multiplies to whomsoever He wills. So look at all the reward, the potential reward awaiting you by merely giving the salah. And some of us are still stingy and miserly. If if you want, if you want peace and tranquility to be among the Muslims, among the means is to spread the salam. Spread the salam about, among the people. Uh, now, the returning the salam, okay, type. So what are the etiquettes of giving salam? The infamous coffee. MashaAllah tabarakallah, alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. What are the etiquettes? Who, who gives salams to who? يُسَلِّمُ الصَّغِيرُ عَلَى الْكَبِيرُ The young person should give salam to the one who's older than him. And that's a very important principle. So the one who initiates the salam is the younger, as a, as a principle. 
ويسلم الماشي على القاعد and the one walking should give salam to the person who's sitting so if you're walking in the street and someone is sitting and you're walking by it's on you to give salam to the sitting person not on him to give salam to you سواء كان الماشي صغيرا أو أو كبيرا قليلا أو كثيرا irrespective of whether the people that are walking are younger or older now that matter of age becomes sidelined because what is important is that the one walking by should be the one giving the salam. Meaning if he's older than the one sitting, he still have to give the salam. Well, it's recommended that he gives salam because we have already established that it's not obligatory. لقول رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يسلم الصغير على الكبير والمر على القاعد والقليل على الكثير. The Prophet said the young one should give salam to the older one and the one walking should give salam to the one sitting and these few should give salam to the majority. So if there's a small number of people, they give salam to those who are larger in number. ويسلم الراكب على الماشي سواء كان الراكب صغيرا أو كبيرا قليلا أو كثيرا. And the one who is riding some sort of vehicle, animal, if that's available to you nowadays, if you're riding your donkey, uh, your Bentley donkey, uh, there you go, that's a new one, Bentley donkey. Uh, then, and you happen to go by someone, then you, you initiate the salam upon the one who is walking. Okay, because you're, you're uh, nowadays, of course, in a vehicle. Then if you're in vehicle, you give the salam to the one who is walking. The same thing, the matter of age becomes uh, irrespective because the priority is given to the one who is on a mount versus the one who is walking on his feet because Prophet said, يُسَلِّمُ الرَّاكِبُ عَلَى الْمَاشِي طيب. Now, the Muslim gives salam to the Muslim, the woman to the woman, and the man to the man. Similarly, the woman may give salam to her maharim, her mahram, and it's obligatory. Uh, and also, the old woman, the old woman, she is among the exceptions where even though she's not a mahram, you may give and, re and get salam back. As for a young woman, then the scholars do not recommend that you initiate salam to a young woman that is not your mahram in order to close the door of fitna. And that shows you how keen Islam is on closing the door of fitna. Tayyip. Um, now, if a, if a person entered upon a group, then uh, he gives him one salam. When you enter upon a group, you say, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah to the, to the audience and to the people. Even though there may be no one at home except you. And you shouldn't. Uh, that many people do. And he sees his homie, yo, man, what's up? If you are sitting with a group of people and you want to leave, then you should you should uh, finalize your gathering with them with a salam of departure, just like you gave salam upon arrival. Because the Prophet Sallallahu said, the first is not more in, is not more worthy than the latter. Meaning, in both cases, when you enter and when you leave, you should end it with the salam. Now, what about the salam to the non-Muslims? And that's a topic that often is addressed. Or actually is often uh, asked about. Do we give salam to the Jews and the Christians? And the clear-cut answer is no. Now, please, my brothers and sisters, let us be reasonable. When we say don't give them the salam, it doesn't mean that when you see them, you frown. Because I am you know, merciful to the believers and I am shadeed. On the uh, the disbelievers, yeah, Captain, yeah, Captain Allah Yisalhak. This is not a warfare. This is da'wah, ya Sheikh. Put that smile on, and be kind. The fact that you cannot give them salam does not mean you cannot say good morning, good afternoon. Hey, how's it going? Howdy, uh, how do you do? Whatever, whatever language, whatever your culture dictates, you that, that that does not take away from the matters that you're supposed to have as a Muslim. What we're saying is don't initiate the salam because the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa said in a clear hadith which is sahih in sahih Muslim 
لا تبدأ اليهود ولا النصارى بالسلام do not, do not initiate the salam to the Jews and the Christians case closed case closed no one has anything to say afterwards however if they say السلام عليكم some of the scholars say that you say like the Prophet ﷺ taught وعليكم because you're not sure whether they said السلام عليكم or السام عليكم poison be upon you like the Jews did so the Prophet ﷺ said وعليكم and on you so that, to summarize so that we don't get confused you, you don't initiate the salam if they give you salam the safest position is to say وعليكم even if you heard And that he will be offended by you saying wa alaykum. So because there's leeway, you can say wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullah, provided that you know for a fact that they didn't say assam. And most of them don't even know that. So you would assume that they're being sincere when they say assalamu alaykum. But the safest position is always to say wa alaykum and call it a day. The fact that we said we don't initiate the salam does not mean we become rude, disrespectful, and then we don't show courtesy and mannerism in our communication. Because salam, ya akhwan and ya akhawat, is a dua. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace of Allah and His uh, mercy and blessings be upon you. This is a huge dua that the non Muslim has not earned as of yet. Hopefully, with your efforts, inshallah, he'll become a Muslim and you can give him salam every time you see him and it's all great. Tayyip. As for, for the Muslims among each other, to replace the salam with other expressions of good morning, good afternoon, so on and so forth. Again, these expressions are lawful, but they should not be given precedence over salam. It is better, and the sunnah is to say assalamu alaikum, or assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, or assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh, depending on how many good deeds you're looking for. Tayyip, there are some etiquettes which, oh, 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 if only the Muslims knew, because, you know, here's a funny thing. I'm going to tell you funny stories, bismillah. The funny story is when a Muslim with a beard, like myself or yourself, I'm assuming you have one inshallah, if you don't start growing it soon, not the sisters, the brothers. Um, if you're a Muslim with a beard and then you're walking around your work and your work is an environment that is, you know, of, of not an Islamic nature, it's not a da'wah center, it's just a regular job. The people will, be, will pay a closer attention to what you do versus the others. Because they, they, they basically want to see to what point you adhere to Islam. Why? Because if they see that you're not adhering to Islam, it actually makes them feel good about themselves. Because they say, look, if this person who's supposed to be practicing Islam is failing and doing so, that's why I face this hundreds of times. I, I could probably say hundreds of times and I'm not exaggerating. Because of this misunderstanding of the issue of the Salam. So what happens is I'll be walking about, I'll be walking around in, in the office, I go by someone, and of course a lot of them like to, you know, fish in, in murky water. So as soon as I go by, they say, Ah, Sheikh! Ah, Sheikh! Assalam lillah, ya Sheikh! The salam is for Allah, ya Sheikh! Where is the salam, ya Sheikh? And of course, you know, your lovely brother loves to give lectures, so what do I do? I give him a lecture. Say, MashaAllah, Tabarakallah, brother, thank you so much for your excitement about the salam. Now, let me tell you first that initiating the salam is a recommended act of worship. It's not obligatory. So calm yourself down. They say, okay, it's a, a recommended act of worship. So why are you depriving me? I say, because I follow certain etiquettes that the scholars mention about the salam that you may not be aware of. So let me kindly inform you about how this works. The scholars say there are many occasions where it's actually disliked to give the salam. Such as if a person is in the bathroom, huh? and you have like Muslims, Salaam Alaikum brother, you in the bathroom? Yani, would you like me to reply to you, Wa Alaikum Salaam while I'm in the bathroom? Raham Abuk, can you wait till I get out of the bathroom? I'm, yani, uh, Alo, Hawwul Ya Baba, Allah, Fiye, Wallah Al Azim, Main Fashi Kalam Da Gama. Or, uh, a person sleeping. You wake him up. Salam alaikum. Brother, are you sleeping? La wallahi, I was just putting on an act. You know, we're doing this uh, frozen uh, moment game. I don't know what that game is where you, you, you freeze. Yeah, and it doesn't, what does it look like? I'm dead? Yeah, I'm sleepy. You wake me up from sleep to tell me if I'm sleeping. 
That's like when you arrive. Oh, brother, you're here? Wait, let me see. Wallahi, it looks like I'm here. Ya yeah, subhanallah. He, he, he. How, how did I come here? La, la. This is amazing. What do you think this is? A ghost? Of course I'm here. It is some questions shouldn't be asked. Uh, it's a person reading the Quran. Yani you sometimes, and this happens all the time. Oh, how many fights did I have to have with people who wanted to fight me in the masjid? You try to go early to the masjid, you know, back when we were going to the masjid, before taraweeh. You want to sit in the masjid, try to recite some Quran. And then every three seconds someone comes in. While you're reading Quran, Salaamu Alaikum Rahmatullah. Now you're in the middle of recitation. You may be reflecting. Allah may have given you that moment of clarity where you can interact with the book of Allah. You have to stop and say, Wa Alaikum Salaamu Wa Rahmatullah Wa Barakatuh. And then you go back to read. Then the next day, Salaamu Alaikum Wa Alaikum Salaamu Wa Rahmatullah Wa Barakatuh. The scholars say it is dislike to give salam to someone who's reading the Quran. Let him, ya akhi, let him be involved in his active worship. Spare him. Spare him. And this is where the this is where Islam is reasonable because you have to weigh those things out, ya akhwan. You have to weigh them on the scale. Yes, you want the reward of the 30 good deeds and you want the reward. But let me give you a piece of information about our religion. Our beautiful religion, wonderful religion. There's something called niyyah, intention. I'm not going to give him the salam because I don't want to interrupt him. Guess what? Allah will give you the reward of giving him the salam and the reward of letting him focus on the Quran. So it's a win-win situation. And what's similar to that is when brothers see you carrying with your hands, literally like you might even, you might even have just come from the supermarket with groceries, like 10 bags of, 10 grocery bags in each hand, and then the brother comes to you and goes, Salaam Alaikum brother. With which hand would you like me to shake, ya captain? Would you like a hand to come out of my bald head and extend into to shake, a third hand to into a chest, open up and a hand comes out? Is this some, 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 some animation? Someone's hand occupied. Have mercy on the brother, man. You don't have to shake his hand. You don't. You don't. The Islam is a reasonable religion. And brothers see you struggling. They see me trying to like put the phone away, put the thing away. And then he still has his hand extended. Be, be courteous and observant. You go, you see a brother's hand occupied. Khalas, khalas. The salam with the mouth is enough. Don't burden the people with that. If you see someone making dua, don't give him salam. If you see someone calling the other hand, don't give him salam. If you see someone praying, it's permissible to give them the salam. It's better to leave them alone. But if you didn't know, you give them the salam and they are allowed to actually return the salam with a hand gesture like the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did. So then when I have these conversations with the brothers, I tell them, Ya Akhi, you were in the middle of work. Or sometimes they be two brothers having a conversation. I did not give you salam because I did not want to interrupt the flow of the conversation. Wallahi, it's not about being stingy or it's not about that. So you are forced to educate sometimes the people because they just want to pick on you. They just want you to do anything without knowledge. Giving the salam is recommended, it's not obligatory. And then there are etiquettes for giving the salam out of courtesy and mercy for people. Some of the scholars say, again, the, the, the text with me doesn't mention it all, but I remember it from other, uh, other books. If someone's eating, you shouldn't give him salam. If someone is busy doing something, you shouldn't give him salam. Basically, you look at the condition of the person. Are you distracting him from something that he's involved in? Wherein, by returning your salam, he may be uh, distracted from ob his objective. If so, you can you can avoid giving the salam specifically because for the sake of Allah. You see how beautiful Islam is when it comes to these issues. So let's, let's try to inshallah practice this, huh? From now on, it'll be very nice and sweet when it comes to salam, so that the salam doesn't become a burden upon the people and it remains to be the lovely quality and trait of Muslims and Islam. Taib, let us speak about the etiquettes of drinking coffee. You take a sip and then you continue. Let us speak about the etiquettes of kalam. And you know what, I want to I wanna make a clarification about something I said yesterday. I was telling you about the debates I've been watching between uh, Muslims and atheists. And I want to be very specific now, very specific because of the feedback I got. I do this because it's my... But I'm in, but Allah blessed me to be involved in da'wah. 
So I involve myself and listen to things because they aid my cause. When I go to Malaysia and I give da'wah to all these uh, uh, students in Nottingham University, all of, from different backgrounds, I need to be well equipped with, with information, contemporary information in order to defend the religion. And it's our job to defend the religion. That said, you should not, in, under any circumstance, anyone listening to me, you may not go and watch debates with atheists or Christians. I am telling you this sincerely. Because out of 10 people, at least 2 to 3 will have doubts in their hearts afterwards. And you cannot promise that you will be one of those 7 who will be saved. Allah says, لا تزكوا أنفسكم هو أعلم بمن اتقى ولا تزكوا أنفسكم do not, do not claim purity for yourself. Allah knows best who is the taqi. You cannot say, no, 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 I am exempt. You don't know whether it will be your turn. Therefore, don't go there. Wallahi, if I didn't have to know this information for da'wah, why would I even bother? The atheists are the most ludicrous people on earth who don't even deserve an, an inch, a minute of attention. If it were up to me, we would never have a debate with a single atheist because he's not worthy to even express his opinion to the people. It is nothing but utter confusion and lies and fabrications and, and nonsense. But today the people want to you know, use their, their uh, philosophical arguments to bring them to Islam and the bottom line is all it does is confuse the Muslims more than it brings atheists to Islam. So please, please be very careful. And I'm saying this because of the word kalam, which is the, the, the science of philosophy. And, and uh, philosophical arguments are extremely dangerous to your faith if you're not well grounded in knowledge. Therefore, do not watch those types of debates because your iman is more important. Your iman is more important and the shaitan is keen on, on diverting you from the path. Wallahi, I'm not saying this because Islam has issues. Uqsum billah, Islam mops the floor with all of them. Islam is a bulldozer. Islam is a bulldozer and nothing can stand against it. It demolishes them all. But not every representative of Islam is capable of doing that. And so you don't know who you're going to wind up watching. And that representative of Islam may say a lot of good things and then he might confuse you with some issues that he has himself, which I've seen plenty of. I don't want to mention any names. The bottom line is, it's a slippery slope. Protect yourself. I have, I have conveyed, oh Allah, you are my witness. I have conveyed to those who, are, uh, those who will see this one day, do not listen to those. And that's not Wajdi Akari's opinion. That's the, that's the fatwa of the scholars. They are very specific about who are exempt from this. And so if you're not, leave that business alone. طيب. Speaking of Adab Al-Kalam, it is recommended that you... When you're speaking with someone that you face them. كان رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم يقبل بوجهه وحديثه على أشر القوم يتألفهم بذلك. Prophet Sallam used to actually direct his face and his speech to the most evil of people because he wants to like make them like Islam. And like some of the people complained, uh, they have guests. You go to someone uh, as a, someone's house as a guest, or even if you're the host, and everybody's sitting on their phones. Yani, this is lack of manners, unless there's an urgent issue, and sometimes you do need to use your phone. And there's no one saying, Malaysia, excuse me, I need to use my phone, it's an important thing, I have something pending, my wife is asking me for this, my son, my uncle, my father, my mom. You, you actually communicate and align with the person, whether you are the host or you're the guest, that there's a reason for you to use the phone. As to go and sit in people's homes and use the phone and not even have eye contact with them. This is actually against the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and it, it indicates lack of manners. And that is not befitting. There's no problem in, in exceptions, but the exceptions should be, should be discussed. And how wonderful and beautiful you would look when you say to the person, Malays, do you mind? I need to use my phone for a couple of minutes. The, the most yani, res responsible and, and logical reply is, of course, of course, go ahead. Yeah, help yourself. So when you go to people's homes, uh, there's, a, there's a level of consideration that we need to also have to, to represent the Prophet ﷺ in the best manner. طيب. Secondly, you should be truthful in your speech. So first, when you talk to people, face them. Face them and give them your attention. Be truthful. The Prophet ﷺ said, Truthfulness leads to righteousness and righteousness leads to Jannah. And the person, a man or a woman, will say the truth and continue to say the truth until he is written as a Siddiq, as a truthful person with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Thirdly, you should avoid idle talk. 
You should avoid idol talk. As Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ الْمُؤْمِنُونَ الَّذِينَ هُمْ فِي صَلَاتِهِمْ خَاشِعُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ عَنِ اللَّغْوِ مُعْرِدُونَ وَالَّذِينَ هُمْ لِزَكَاتِ فَاعِلُونَ They have attained success, the believers, those who are uh, subservient and, and uh, they have tranquility in their salah and those who avoid idol talk and those who pay the zakah. The scholars say that Allah Azza wa Jal placed avoiding the idol talk between salah and zakah to show you how important it is. And so that is basically idle talk is any speech that is unacceptable or not useful. So useful speech is deen, useful speech is dunya, uh, but uh, uh, speech that is absolutely useless, then that's something that the believer should avoid. Uh, fourthly, you should avoid uh, when, when, when an ignorant person addresses you, and we will speak about the exceptions because a lot of people are going to misunderstand this, uh, when the, يعني, it's best that you avoid the ignorant people. وَإِذَا خَطَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا سَلَامَ As Allah says in Surah Al-Furqan, and when the ignorant people speak to them, they say words of peace. يعني, they don't engage the ignorant person. Now, that is what the idle kind of argumentation and engaging with the uh, ignorant person, not the one wherein you're trying to advise, rectify, and reconcile, and rectify, and, and how many times I'm gonna say rectify? Twice is enough. Were well, you trying to actually educate or convey some information to them? Fifthly, abandoning argumentation. Uh, Abi Umama narrated, رضي الله عنه قال رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم ما ضل قوم بعد هدى كانوا عليه إلا أوتوا الجدل ثم تلا رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم هذه الآية ما ضربوه لك إلا جدلا بل هم قوم خصيمون سورة الزغر في آية 58 The Prophet ﷺ said no people have been led astray after they had found guidance no people go astray after they had found guidance except that they will be given they will be tested with the trait of argumentation then he recited the آية and they, may, they only struck to you the similitude, and that is of Jesus. That's what the kuffar of Quraysh did. Illa jadalan, just so you can, for mere argument purposes. Rather, they are people that are just argumentative. So, uh, the, the quality of arguing endlessly, people going back and forth, and how often and abundant is that on, on social media? Yee, there's no beginning and end for it. Ya Sheikh, every mufti in the dunya is out there. Yani, for example, you give a talk. And in the talk, you warn the Muslims for a valid reason about an ex person who's, who's uh, dangerous uh, to the Iman and the, uh, of the believers. Someone will come on your page and mop the floor with you for speaking ill about another Muslim. What he doesn't realize that he just did the same thing that he's criticizing you of. Hello? He just did the same thing that he's criticizing of. He has a problem with you criticizing him, but he's criticizing you. He says you did it on a public platform and you did it on a public platform. So yeah, brothers and sisters, yani, please, let's be reasonable. Wallahi, wallahi, it's not an obligation on you to, to type a comment every time you see something. Some things are left for those people in that field. Leave the people in that field to deal with their issues on their own. They have their reasons. As for you, the safest thing to do is mind your business. Be a passive, silent observer. Don't involve yourself in this stuff because it might explode in your face. Especially when you do it out of emotionalism or attachment to celebrity or just, just you talk, talk nonsense. Until now, people say, oh, this guy is paid by uh, the government to do... Yeah, akhi, what government pays me? I work for Samsung. Yeah, Captain Allah Yahdiq. No one pays me anything to say anything to anyone. Wallah al -azim, you, you, and the people will slander. What well, me or many others? They will come and slander you, and you will stand before Allah on Yom al Qiyamah and say, "Oh Allah, this person said this about me, and Wallah, I'm, and you know I'm innocent." And you will take from this person's good deeds. Ya akhi, why would you want to put yourself in this predicament? Just because we are communicating a particular type of da'wah, you automatically assume that it's being supported and and helped and aided by X, Y, Z. All of this is from your brain. It's all from your brain. You have no proof from Allah Azza wa Jal. Allah didn't reveal it to you. So the safest thing is zip it, man. Just zip it. Don't speak. Don't speak because your fingers will bear witness against you on Yawm Al-Qiyamah for every comment you've typed on every YouTube channel. So either you are entitled because you are qualified and then there's, uh, there are means of dealing with this issue or you're not. Mind your business. Play it 
safe. It's best for you. Be safe. Well, that's my sincere advice. Look, trust me. If it were up to me, it's lovely. The more people slander me or any other da'i, the more good deeds we will get. We need them. Wallah, we need them. We come on the day Alhamdulillah, my good deeds were enough. Come ya, come ya. Anta, anta. What was your name? Jiggy Biggy and Ziggy Wiggy and Miggy Miggy and Piggy Biggy. Come, everybody. Uh, all these uh, funny names that the people create on their YouTube channels and Facebook. Come, 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 come. Give me, give me. Give me your good deeds. Zakallah khair. Give me your good deeds. Because you said A, B, C, D about me that Allah didn't tell you about. You made assumptions based on what? Based on what? You criticize me of things that you're doing. Then what's, your, what's the issue? The funny thing is, those people, when it comes to the rulers, when it comes to the rulers, they want you to publicly speak against the rulers. And when it comes to uh, the deviant people, they want you to advise them in private. The most, common, the most common comment, brother, you could have sent an email to the brother in private. But when it comes to the rulers, no, no, you should on the member be brave and then call them out. Everything is against the sunnah. The sunnah is that when the ruler has an issue, you advise him in private. As the Prophet ﷺ instructed, you're not allowed to discuss it on, in public uh, uh, platforms and social media and on, on the member. As for the mubtadi' and the, the, the person who's misguided the Muslims and the innovators, publicly, you have to address the issue publicly. You send them an email, he's going to put it in a spam, man. Oh, Allah understand. Anyways, tayyib, um, when you speak, you should, Bismillah. You should give a chance to the uh, person you're speaking with, and you shouldn't, yani, you shouldn't try too hard to articulate and be eloquent. Let it be a natural speech. The Prophet ﷺ said, لا يستقيم إيمان عبد حتى يستقيم قلبه. The, the faith of a person will not be upright until his heart will be upright. وَلَا يَسْتَقِيمُ قَلْبُهُ حَتَّى يَسْتَقِيمَ لِسَانُهُ And his heart will never be upright until his tongue is upright. So from the etiquettes is that when you have a conversation with someone, try not to interrupt. Allow them to finish what they have to say and then you respond accordingly. And that's from the etiquette of, especially in, in the area of debating. Because, you know, it takes away from your points of strength if you don't allow the person to speak. Uh, also, uh, you should, uh, see here's an important, that you should speak to each person according to what is suitable for that recipient. Meaning not all people are, should be addressed the same. And be careful of honoring a disobedient, a disbeliever, or a hypocrite for no reason. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, لا تقول للمنافق سيد. Don't say to the hypocrite, Master. Because even if he is, you have made your Lord angry. And of course, under this is, is the exception when it comes to dealing with people that will, will take away from our Islam. And you say, Akhi, you always talk about this. Of course, we have to talk about this. Look at the, look at the condition we're, on, we're in right now. Do, are we fooling each other? Would you like me to fool you? Would you like me to deceive you? Or would you like me to be sincere? Go on YouTube and type Muslim speakers. See the results you will get. Do you really think that if you listen to any one of them, it's all going to be beautiful and lovely and you're going to go straight to Jannah with that information? No, Allah, it's not. This is the truth. Regardless of the language. And so yani, there's an area of our religion where we have to know who we speak with in which way and who we have to speak with in a different way because of the situation. And it's fine. It's fine. And they can respond with, with an equal way. If you if you if you warn against certain people, they want to reply accordingly. No problem. Let the people that are involved in that area in that field deal with each other. Just like if a doctor speaks about another doctor who's giving false information, it is not for the patients to interfere and tell this doctor you should do this and you should do that. Leave the doctors to manage their own business, and you remain a patient and be patient. It's a good one, huh? Right. Hey. Now, uh, and be careful of saying some lousy, lousy words. Uh, some words that you will regret on Yawm Al-Qiyamah. The Prophet ﷺ said, وَإِنَّ الْعَبْدَ لَا يَتَكَلَّمُ بِالْكَلِمَةِ مِنْ سَخَطِ اللَّهِ لَا يُلْقِ لَهَا بَالًا يَهْوِي بِهَا فِي جَهَنَّمُ الْعِيَادُ بِاللَّهِ And a man and a slave will say one word due to the anger of Allah. He doesn't even pay attention to it. He will be thrown into the hellfire. He will be thrown because of that word in the hellfire. So be careful of what you say 
Be careful of slandering the Muslims. Be careful of inventing lies about them. Be careful of painting them all with the same brush. Be careful of generalization. Be careful of lies and, and, and fabrications. Be careful of a million things that might affect your life to come and your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wallahi, wallahi, it is not worth it in any way, shape or form. Okay. Now, regarding joking. Now, this is going to be awkward because I am a, a firm believer in the effectiveness of joking, of course, within the guidelines that we will mention, in helping you uh, communicate with people and conveying the message. And what the people need to understand is that not all situations are the same. Meaning, meaning. I've heard many people say, Ya Akhi, Jazakallah uh, Khair, you're talking about the deen and you're giving a lecture. Ya Akhi, it's not appropriate for you to joke. It's not appropriate for you to joke. This is this is matter of ilm and knowledge and you should have the manners of the people of knowledge and you should have the, you know, the haiba and so on and so forth. Say, Jazakallah Khair, your, your speech is ala rasi. It's 100% correct. But Ya Captain, what is the context and who is my audience? If my audience is 50% people that barely pray, barely practice Islam, uh, they, they, what they're exposed to is, is uh, extreme jokers who already let them continue in their way of deviance and make them feel good about themselves. Or the other alternative, someone that is so serious to the point that they feel a form of disconnect, it becomes important to try to create a balance depending on my audience. If I were a sheikh, one of the mashayikh, uh, you know, if I was sheikh bin uh, Uthaymi, rahimahullah, or sheikh bin Baz, or Albani, and Albani, rahimahullah, used to joke a lot, by the way. But if I was hypothetically a sheikh, and I'm sitting on my chair, and all my tulab, all my students are there with their notepads and pens, then this would be an occasion where joking is not really likely to happen. But if you're in a public lecture, you're given a reminder, you're given an admonishment, and you insert joking into it, that is actually, it's like salt and spice to the food. And so don't be extreme and don't turn it into a comedy show either. So there has to be moderation. One of the conditions and etiquettes of joking is that you may not lie. You may not lie. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Ana Zaimun Bibaitin fi Rabadil Jannah Libantarik Libantarak al Kadiba wa in Kalamaziha. I am Guaranteeing, I guarantee a house in the middle of Jannah. في محيط الجنة الخارجي meaning in the outskirts of Jannah. I'm sorry, in the outskirts of Jannah. For anyone who leaves alone lying, even though he's just joking. And this is a calamity that the Muslims have today. A calamity that the Muslims have today. Because a lot of people, they, they make these jokes. And they're lying in the joke, and then after you panic and you freak out and you almost have a heart attack, says, Ya Akhi, I'm just joking. La Ya Baba, you cannot joke and lie. Your joke has to be also a truth. Your joke cannot be a lie. So how many people say, Well, brother, I have bad news for you. You know, I just saw that uh, someone stole your car. And then you freak out and you jump and you go out, you saw your car outside, Ya Akhi, I was just joking. Ya Baba, why are you joking, Ya Baba? What joking is this? It's not allowed. Your joke has to be truthful. If your joke is a lie, Khali Wali, my uncle Wali, that's what we're going to call him. When I say my uncle Wali, you know I'm speaking about Khali Wali. If you didn't get it, don't trip. And in your joke, there should be no backbiting and there should be no slandering anyone. As Allah says in the Quran, Thirdly, uh, that the, the appropriateness of the time. So if you are at a grave and, and, and someone was just buried and a, a, a brother is given an admonishment, which is from the sunnah, that someone gives a small mawidah uh, during or after the burial, it is not a time for you to crack a joke over there and try to be funny. You understand what I'm saying? If it's a serious uh, uh, you know, knowledge acquisition settings, then you shouldn't joke. Uh, you shouldn't joke. If someone is reminding about, yani, there are occasions for when you can joke and there are times when you should be extremely serious. Fourthly, don't overdo it and don't go to extremes. And one of the extremes is, uh, and that's the one we're going to discuss right now. One of the extremes is when you go overboard in harming others. 
And a classic example is pranks. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا يحل لمسلم أن يروع مسلما It is not permissible for a Muslim to scare a fellow Muslim. And my brothers and sisters in faith, pranks are fundamentally you scaring a Muslim. Whatever the prank may be, I would say to you that 99.99% .99 of them are haram because of the damage that they cause to that fellow Muslim. You may not prank people. You may not prank people. That's just the, the very uh, painful truth. And I know that pranks are very popular today uh, and people love them. Uh, you know, you take something valuable from him, you steal a scar key, uh, worse than that, you, you know, you pull a stunt and you have some, you know, hole in the ground where he falls into or something that falls on his head. And, you know, of course, people are very creative with pranks. You cannot prank a Muslim, man. Because you are, this is a form of adha and it's a form of darar. And Allah already warns in the Quran. Those who يؤذون المؤمنين والمؤمنات بغير ما اكتسبوا المؤمنين والمؤمنات بغير ما اكتسبوا فقد احتملوا بهتانا وإثما مبينا Those who harm the believing men and believing women for nothing that they had done then they will carry the sin of, of slander and major sin and then of course from the hadith Prophet no harm and no reciprocation of harm you cannot prank the people please please take it easy sixthly the matter of uh, jokes that include uh, uh, foul speech. A lot of people, the jokes include bad words, uh, uh, cursing, swearing, um, other inappropriate things. You are not allowed to share these jokes. You are not allowed to communicate them. You're not allowed to forward them. I don't know if you remember my lecture, Do Not Forward. It's a very serious matter. It's all in your book of deeds. You share this joke. 10, 100, 50, 000, Allah wa alam, how many people read it? If it has a curse word and everybody had to read that curse word, then you will be responsible for that. So be very careful about uh, maintaining manners and the etiquettes of Islam. The Prophet ﷺ was not a person who used foul language. Seventhly, and one of the most critical and dangerous one is, please, my brothers and sisters, do not joke about Islam. The matters of the religion are never to be joked about because that is a fine line between Iman and the lack of it. And I think we discussed in the second episode about the etiquette of the Messenger of Allah the seriousness of this issue. A lot of people make jokes about matters of Jannah and matters of Nar and they speak on behalf of the Shaitan that the Shaitan said this or the Shaitan said that and so on and so forth. All of these are, are dangerous and you may not joke about matters that entail mocking the deen. Protect your religion by not delving into these areas at all. Even though that is very, very common today. It's almost everywhere you go. طيب. And then lastly, uh, that يعني, when you're joking with people that are older than you, then you have to be considerate also. You don't want to hurt someone's feelings uh, by saying a certain joke. So a believer is someone who is uh, considerate, someone who is wise. A believer is someone who, who reflects. So before you say something, weigh it out. Anytime you want to open your mouth and utter some statements, first reflect. Is what I'm about to say suitable, rewardable, pleasing to Allah? Or is it something that might backfire and, and uh, blow up in my face? So be careful of saying things that may harm the fellow Muslims or hurt someone's feelings. You may joke about, you know, someone's uh, mother or father and one of his, and his mother or father had passed away. Right, what, how, are you going to, how are you going to rectify that? How are you going to fix it after you broke that person's heart? فعني, there, are, there are ways of, of dealing with it. You don't joke with the scholars. You don't joke with people that are older than you. You know, there has to be a level of respect. If that older person wants you to joke with them, then you, you do so, but you should always be very careful as to not cross a line and wind up saying something that is not, يعني, uh, that is not pleasing to Allah. And then lastly, uh, it should all be in moderation. It shouldn't be the type of joke where people start, you know, they fall on the floor, as they say, rolling on the floor laughing and you go out of your way to laugh so hard, uh, you're almost about to die. Uh, joking should be in moderation. Prophet ﷺ, he used to, uh, he always used to smile. He would smile. His laugh was actually 
a smile. They, 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 I, I don't recall any narrations that mention him actually laughing hard as we laugh today. And that is because Prophet ﷺ said, if you knew what I know, you would have laughed a little, you would have cried a lot. Of course, because of his concern for the Ummah and because of his responsibility وسلم, for the life to come. And in him is an example for us as well. So everything should be done in moderation. And so in summary, you see that you should give salam to the people. You should return the salam of the people. Try to go for the longer version of salam alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh to get the greater reward inshallah ta'ala. Uh, again, uh, when, you, when, you, when you want to joke, then joke in moderation. Uh, these are some of the things which are known to a lot of us, but maybe not implemented as much. Uh, let's make a serious effort to start practicing them among our family members, right? You can start with your family member. You give the salam, initiate the salam, spread the salam about the, uh, among the people. Perhaps Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will look at us with the eyes of mercy and, and uh, alleviate this calamity that has befallen us. You know, brothers and uh, sisters, as you know, as time uh, goes by, uh, the, the uh, calamities that are resulting from the COVID uh, coronavirus, the novel coronavirus, uh, are becoming... Uh, at a very large scale uh, it's not a joke anymore you know what i'm saying it was never a joke honestly but now it's like now you're realizing the seriousness economies are collapsing uh, people are losing their jobs uh, mankind is, is 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 in a state of shock until now uh, we don't know how to deal with it our lifestyles have changed uh, and these these are these are things that you know should be of concern about the human beings being in such a bad condition that Allah Azza wa Jal is testing us in this manner. And so it, it requires that we, the Muslims, if because the rest of the world doesn't care. Uh, the Muslims, because they don't care in a sense that they don't care about Allah. They, they find uh, worldly means to fix the situation. But only the believers know that this is all in the hands of Allah. And if Allah wills, it can all be changed in a split second. And the virus will disappear instantaneously. If Allah wills, we all have that belief. So yani, we as Muslims need to, to lead the way. And we lead the way by returning to our deen. Nothing is going to fix it. If we don't return to our deen, then our situation is not going to get any better. It doesn't mean that the virus won't go away. It will go away. But in terms of the status of mankind, then it's going to deteriorate and deteriorate until the last day. So let us Muslims, even with those straightforward, simple acts of worship, be among those who do things on earth that Allah is pleased with. And perhaps Allah Azza wa will send His mercy upon us and alleviate the, the, uh, the testing and the, and the uh, hardship that we're going through as means of us saving mankind from the disasters that they have brought upon themselves. Corruption has appeared in the land and the sea because what the people have earned with their own hands. It is our fault. Let us, let us make up and fix our relationship with Allah. Zakum Allah khair for uh, tuning in. And I will see you inshallah ta'ala in the next episode. Subhanakallah wa bihamdik. Ashadu an la ilaha illa anta. Astaghfiruka tu bulay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks for watching this video. Subscribe and click on the notification bell. Like, comment, and share with friends and family.